Robert, welcome and thank you to be here with me today. Really appreciate that. I am an admirer of your books. I've been reading your books since years and having you here for this conversation is, is a true honor. One of the things that I've learned during our conversation in preparation to this interview, Robert, is that you're not just an author and a passionate uh, writer, but you are busy in the digital world as well. You do podcasts, you do online uh, uh, presentations, and we will discuss about this later on in the, in, in the meeting. But what I would like to do at the beginning of this conversation with you is digging into one of the aspects of your youth when, when you grew up. In fact, during one of our first conversations, you told me of being a dyslexic. However, you didn't discover this until you were a 33 years old man. A lot of brethren have shared with me uh, having you know, to live with this condition and, and the struggles that they have. Can I ask you, if you look back in time, how did being a dyslexic impact the way of your learning and how that leads you to become a world-recognized writer? Well, I didn't have a problem with dyslexia when I was a child because I didn't know it existed and nobody had invented it. So I was just a bit thick. <laughs> so I could live with that quite easily. And uh, the, the issue I had was that reading was enormously difficult. I, every, every time I, I was shown a word, it looks like a, a shape to me. And of course, if you look at a word in context, it's all right showing it on a flashcard. I got very good at that quite quickly. I could read that. Then they hid it in blocks of text. And of course, if you hide a shape in blocks of text, then there are nine different positions you can put it in. At the beginning of the first line, in the middle of the first line, at the end of the first line. And it looks different in every position. Or you could put it in the middle of the block of text, at the beginning, middle or end, and other three positions. Or perhaps on the last line, beginning, middle or end. And in every one, the surrounding space looks different. And the word looks different. So there are ten forms for every font, for every word that you have to learn. That makes it 56,000 times harder to read for a basic vocabulary for a dyslexic person than it is for a person who can use the alphabet. Now, how do I learn the alphabet? And they look at me and say, what do you mean? You don't know the alphabet? I said, no, don't know the alphabet. Can't learn it, never will learn it. How do I find it in that book? So I said, I'll tell you how I find it. I open it from the back and I flip forward and I look at the top line. I look for a word, vaguely, a symbol vaguely of the right shape. And if I find it, I look around it until I can find it. And it takes me forever. So I can't be bothered with a dictionary. Because even then, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to translate that shape into handwriting. And anybody who's seen my handwriting will understand that. <laughs> so, so effectively, reading was a great mystery to me. But uh, mathematics weren't. Because there are only a, a, a limited number of symbols to learn, to learn how to do arithmetic. There are, in fact, nine of them. And those are very easy to manipulate. So you can see the shapes, you can see how they work, you can see how they merge together. So I very quickly learned to calculate. So I could, I could do my timetables, I could do my numbers. That was simple. Having, fa having miserably failed the 11 plus, I did actually meet a very inspirational teacher, a guy called John Roberts. And one of the things that had dawned on me was that symbols can be used to learn things. Because my father wanted to be a pianist and he'd never had the opportunity to study it greatly. And he had a piano. And so he started taking me for music lessons at the age of about six. And so every Saturday morning, I used to be taken down to this great big house on Lower Broughton Road and sit in front of the grand piano of Mr. David Rudosky, who taught me to play music. And at first, it didn't make a lot of sense. 
But slowly but surely, we start. I started to learn that if I uh, if I looked at the symbols, I could translate them into movements of my hand on the keyboard, and I could soon learn that I could create music that way. He was a good teacher, and I started to automatically look at the symbols. Now, the symbols of music are much easier to read than the symbols of words because they're on staves, and you can look at the position on the stave and see the chord and see the key and, and so on, and you can easily change this into hand movements. And then we progressed from learning uh, popular songs which have words. Gosh, if you put them on a stave, they're much easier to read. And so I started to look at those and thought, that's interesting. Is there a word piano anywhere? Well, there wasn't such a word piano, but there was a typewriter. And my cousin Joan had uh, learned how to touch type. So she got hold of a second-hand uh, typewriter for me and started to teach me to touch type. So I learned how to touch type. at the. Uh, I started to learn at the age of about 10. And by the time I was 12, I was a, comf I was a competent touch typer. Don't look at the keyboard, so it can cause disasters if I haven't put my fingers in the right place, because I type everything misplaced, however, where I put my hands. But there are little knobs on the keyboard where you can feel where you got in the right place. Instead of typing the shapes onto a keyboard and learning the word shapes there, I can make these separate symbols and lump them together to form word shapes. So I decided to teach myself italic. I well, don't think I can spell, because I can't. The way I actually have to do it is I visualize the key on the keyboard. I look at the key as I press in my... De oh, I've got eidetic memory, by the way. I can remember everything. My problem is not remembering, it's trying to forget. <laughs> and so I could look at the... I could, I could press a key on the keyboard, look at it on the screen, and then look at the... look up the... Uh, a symbol in italics, and I learned, I learned to write that way. So I, I was able to fake being able to write by the time I, I was I was 15. I moved on to sort of a technical college where I did uh, double maths and physics, pure maths, applied maths, and physics. And they're easy. I only discovered I was dyslexic after I'd been married and uh, had children. And my daughter proved to be dyslexic. And she was... She was struggling to read, and it was a friend of my, a friend of mine at the school who was the headmaster of the school said, "I think she's got a problem. She might be dyslexic." And I said, "What's dyslexia?" <laughs> <laughs> and he sort of explained it to me, and uh, and then he tested he tested Delith for uh, my daughter for for dyslexia, and uh, said that she was she was extremely dyslexic. And he said, would you mind me testing you? I said, no, go ahead. <laughs> so he tested me, and he did all sorts of strange things and asked me to write things with different hands, and I did it. And he said, you're worse than she is. <laughs> I said, oh. I said, I didn't know that. <laughs> and he said, do you know you write perfect mirror writing if you write with your left hand? I said, no, I just read it in the other direction. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it, the, the, the sense changes depending on the direction you read it. And if it's upside down, you start at the bottom yeah. and read in the opposite direction. You can read it perfectly. So, so what's you know what what was the issue? So that's when I discovered I was dyslexic. <laughs> amazing, amazing, Robert. Robert, you you went through your academic uh, uh, life, and then you start teaching, and you start investigating Freemasonry, being a Freemason, as a skilled pathologist, to such a level of details that we can appreciate in your books. Can I ask you if, in you know, all the history that you have investigated and wrote about in your books, is there a personality that you prefer that have impressed you in the way that they've impacted uh, Freemasonry, and why? Ah, I've got a few Masonic heroes. But uh, I think if we go back to the very beginning, probably the, the man who impresses me most is the man I know least about. But he's a guy called uh, David Menzies, 
and he was master of the Lodge of Aberdeen in uh, 1483. I found a bit about him, but not an awful lot. There's a bit about him in the minutes of the Aberdeen Borough Council. And he's the one that was associated with the Kirkwall Scroll and the creation of it and brought together a jumbled model of Masonic symbols. So he's my first, but I don't know a lot about him. But let's come down let's come a bit further down. Let's let's come down to a Mason who was initiated in sixteen forty one, which is a, a little bit more recent than uh, I don't know when David Mendes was initiated, but I do know he was right worshipful master of the lodge in uh, in 1483 yeah. so i don't know when he was but i know when this this second masonic hero was initiated and it was in newcastle in uh, 1641 and that's sir robert murray oh yeah uh, and sir robert murray is an incredibly fascinating person he uh, he was an engineer he was an early physicist he was a he was a scientist he was a spy he was a turncoat. He worked for uh, he worked for both sides during the Civil War. Wow. He was a member of the Covenanters. He was in, responsible for the fortifications for the Covenanters' army when they invaded Newcastle, which was why he, why he uh, ended up being uh, initiated by John Milne and General Hamilton <laughs> on, on a travelling warrant from the Lodge of Edinburgh which is still extant in, in Great George Street. And he took the he took as his Masonic sign, his Masonic mark, because in those days, of course, you did the sequence properly. You did the mark before you did the third degree. He took as his Masonic mark, the five-pointed star. Now, I was, I was impressed with that, because the five-pointed star, of course, it is, uh, devolves from what the pattern you get if you map the, the rising and setting points over an eight-year cycle of the planet Venus on the horizon, and you plot that on a circle, and you get a five-pointed star. Now, I think that I think that's a beautiful symmetry between the bright morning star and the five-pointed star. So, he founded the Royal Society, and he was. He was a mason in the Lodge of Edinburgh. You can tra you can find out more about him because you can find out from the minutes of the Lodge when he'd attended things and I know when he turned up for other people's initiations. And I, I got to know quite... I, I actually wanted to write a biography of him and I couldn't persuade any publisher to take it. So I decided I'd write a history of the Royal Society instead and disguise the history of Robert Murray in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called the Invisible College, or free, or the American edition is Freemasonry and the Birth of Modern Science. Right. And it's really a biography of my Masonic hero, Robert Murray, although I put other people in that he interacted with. He was involved in all sorts of oddball escapades. He was a, he, he got arrested and imprisoned and uh, was actually ransomed out of prison by yeah. Cardinal Richelieu and sent as an agent over to subvert uh, Charles of Charles of um, Charles the second uh, sorry Charles the first and effectively he uh, he negotiated the uh, he negotiated the surrender of Charles the first oh. at Newark and uh, to the to the Covenanters, who then sold him to Oliver Cromwell because there's no money to pay the to pay the soldiers. Yeah. But that, that, there's a striking thing about this. Can I share a, a little symbolism? That once you've got it in your head, you'll never get rid of. He, he surrendered at Newark. Yeah. Now, if you take the symbols that make up the letter of Newark and let them rearrange themselves with a W on the front you end up with a word that's something totally different that sums up what I feel about Charles I. <laughs> and once you've seen it, you will never be able to unsee it. Okay. And I don't intend to say the word. Well, I <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> but Robert Murray is, is, is one, of my, uh, one of my heroes, basically because he founded the Royal Society. And he founded it to help Charles I solve the problem of his navy. There were all sorts of questions relating to the hidden mysteries of nature and science that weren't being solved by anybody. And the Royal Society took that remit on board 
copied the what Murray had learnt about the ways of running the lodge from the Shaw statutes in uh, in Edinburgh, and applied it to science. And the result was, he managed to get a, a royal permit to publish. He created the Royal Society, and the Royal Society gave us the basis of modern science. And it was all about forbidding the discussion of um, politics and talking about the hidden mysteries of nature and science. But I've got other other Masonic heroes. Wow. Uh, Thomas Telford, for example. I think he's a wonderful Masonic hero, the way he applied his, his knowledge of masonry to building things like the stonework on Penti Ponte Casilti Viaduct. Wow. And, and also, the way in which he applied the... Uh, the principle of the inverted Catenian arch, which is held, which is described in the furniture of the lodge, when the sojourner holds up his his cord to show a little, use that to uh, to support the flat bed across the uh, Menai Bridge. Ah. And uh, he he was also a very active Freemasonry and managed to save a lodge that was almost going bust in Ch in Shropshire. So uh, Telford, Telford's another of my Masonic heroes. And of course, there's also George and Robert Stevenson, also Masonic heroes. And they built the other bridge across the Menai, the Tubular Bridge. <laughs> so if it wasn't for a Masonic conspiracy, Anglesey would not have any bridges connecting its <laughs> oh, mainland. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we are a conspiring organization. And we do things and uh, effectively, they're, 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 they're not my own Masonic hero. Enrico Fermi is one that I want to do a podcast on. Ah. Uh, I know his story. I know how he was uh, how he was inspired by uh, the second degree, and I've never yet got round to telling it. So I'm ah. going to have to write a podcast on it. And now that you mentioned this, I mean, you are publishing a series of podcasts about each one of the, your heroes as well. Yes, there's quite a few in there. Yeah. And uh, so there's a there's a whole raft of them. Some of them are more favourites than others. 